Amen, church. Good to be with you. Janae and I have been a part of a church camp since 2003. That was their first official year. Church camp we were part of is called the Leadership Camp, and uh, it was born out of another church camp. There was a, a church camp that Uh, decided they needed something for the older kids. They wanted to teach the older kids how to step up and become leaders in the faith. And from that church camp, there has been so many preachers and teachers and evangelists that have come out of this leadership camp. And so in 2003, they had their very first session, uh, which was right around the time I was 15 years old. And Janae said, if you're going to date me, you got to go to church. And she drug me to church camp. I remember telling her that first year, about halfway through the week, she asked me, That is not a candid pick, by the way. That is so posed right there. Um, Somebody handed me a Bible and said, since you're up there, let me take your picture. Um, uh, uh, I remember telling her that first year at church camp, uh, I said, man, this has been such a great week. I said, I I really love you people. I said, I don't think I'm ever going to be a Christian, but I sure like hanging out with you guys. And of course, I was baptized about a year later. And then I was like, well, I'll keep coming back to camp. You know, I'll never be a minister, but I'll, but I'll be a Christian, right? And, uh, and lo and behold, right? Um, so uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about some Bible verses. While we're not talking about the Bible verses, we're just going to keep scrolling through some of these pictures. So Brianna, if you'll just, if you'll just keep them running the whole time, because I want you guys to see the impact that was had this year. Uh, this was our 20th year at the leadership camp. Uh, I've been a part of it as a camper and a staff member all 20 years. I've been a staff member for probably about, uh, what, 16, 17 years, something like that uh, at that camp. And some weeks, some years, the week of camp is better than others. Some years, the staff just knows their role. They, they know how God is calling them to serve that week. And, and the campers uh, come in with their questions and they're spiritually seeking. And they've got burdens that they've been holding on to all year. And they finally find a safe place where they can start talking about the things that are going on in their life. And when the recipe comes together just right, you have such an amazing, impactful year. But what it takes is it takes everybody knowing what God is calling them to do in their work work of service to the Lord while they're there serving. And so as I thought about it, and I thought about, you know, what do I want to bring out from, uh, from this year of camp? Uh, the thing that keeps sticking to my mind is everybody serving in all the ways that I can't serve. And that's what's so neat about camp, because you've got guys there uh, that do nothing but sweat and build things and work on things, and they're building sets, and they're building props, and they're designing theme nights, and, and all they're doing the whole time is like carpentry and construction and, and, and creative stuff, and, and they're unloading and loading trailers, and they're mowing grass, and they're taking care of kids that, are, that have skinned up knees, and, and, and they're never in a Bible study all week long, but they leave with their heart filled because they know that even though they're not a teacher or a preacher, they went there and they use their gifts to serve the kingdom of God and everybody is blessed because of it. So I want to draw your attention real quick to a passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Uh, Now, you guys probably know I preach out of the NIV because it's a thought-for-thought Bible translation. It's very accessible. It's very digestible. And so, uh, but it is not a word-for-word Bible translation. And so sometimes when you're doing some critical study in the text, you want a Bible that has all the words in it. You want a Bible that's translating straight from the original language. And we're going to see the limitations of this easier translation this morning. So bear with me as we talk about this. Uh, Paul has basically, he said, hey, not only do I walk the walk, not only do I talk the talk, but I walk the walk. And so he's been making an offense for his ministry. People have been accusing him. They've been going, you know what, Paul, you write these fancy letters, but when you show up at our church, you're not really that great of a speaker. And he goes, that's kind of the point because I'll write to you about it. But when I get there, my goal isn't just to talk about it. My goal is to be about it. And so he lets them know, he goes, man, I'm going to show it to you in our actions because that's what uh, humble Christians who are living their life for God, that's what they do. And so you get here and he says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves, some who pat themselves on the back. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Now, hold on. Notice this word measure. 
the word measure there, the Greek word there is metron, and that's a word that, it, that is actually used like six times in these verses, but we're only going to see it once or twice in the NIV. It's not a word that means a lot to us in English, so we, we don't always bring it across in our translation, but I want you to know that it's there. When they measure themselves, so there's this, there's this allotment, there's this portion that they're giving themselves when they judge themselves, and he says, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. He's going, the reason they're bragging is because they don't have context. They have a small ministry for God. And when God blesses it, they think they're the ones that made it happen. And so they are using themselves, their own righteousness and their own idea of, of morality to judge others against themselves. And so instead of holding Jesus as the standard, they're holding themselves as the standard, which is a mistake because that means the only person that's right are the other Christians that do it exactly like you. And it removes the opportunity for God to go, no, we don't want all the Christians looking like you and thinking like you, and being like you, and working like you, what we need is a variety of people serving to the Lord's church in a variety of ways. We want the members of this church to look different, and to serve differently, and to have different opinions on how they can best serve the kingdom of God. And so he goes, they make a mistake. They are not wise when they compare themselves with themselves. We, however, will not boast beyond our proper limits. Now, uh, New American Standard, English Standard Version, uh, any of our literal word-for-word -word translations, instead of proper limit, we will not boast beyond our measure. And you see that word measure again, that word metron in the Greek. And so what he's saying is he's saying there is a, there is a portion that's been given to us. There is, a, there is a, a sphere of influence. There is a, a limit. There is a boundary that God has called you to. He's going, hey, look, you can't do it all. You're not going to do it all, but there are some people that I've called you to reach. There's some work of service that I've called you to influence. There is a, a demographic or an area that I've called you to impact through the unique giftedness that I've given you that I haven't given the other people in your church. There is a there is a measure. And Paul's going, man, I'm not trying to brag about it all. I'm not trying to boast in any of it. He's going, we will not boast beyond our measure, beyond our limits, but we will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. Let me read that to you real quick out of a literal translation. I want you to see how many times this word metron that we're translating in English to measure comes across in this text. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 in the New American Standard. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. So you see it three times there. He uses this idea. There is a an allotment. There is a portion that God has given you. And so what the Bible teaches you is he says, listen, I have a people for you to reach. I have a measure. I have a portion. I have a sphere of influence. And I'm going to gift you with a portion of faith that is equal to the amount of people that I'm calling you to impact. You don't have to save the whole world. If all the Christians are working their measure, then God's going to save the whole world through the influence of Christians that are serving within the proportion of ministry that God has called you to serve. A very simple way to say this is sometimes God calls you to stay in your lane and to do what you do best and serve the people that God has put you in proximity to and honor the people that God has put you in position to influence and then serve the people that God has given you permission to serve or rather that the people themselves have given you permission to serve. So he says... Do we have verse 14 there? That's okay. Um, I, I want to use this to set up uh, what we see in Romans chapter 12. Because you see this word again, and, and we, we miss it when we're reading in some of our other translations. But in Romans chapter 12, all he's talking about, he's going, man, some of you were made to be teachers, and some of you were made to be encouragers, and some of you, like God blessed you with a bunch, and he's calling you just to be very generous and to be great givers and to, to lift other people up through your financial giving. And others, he's calling to go into the mission field. And others, he's calling to just speak out the word of God in a prophetic way that 
that just hits people in the face. You know, when you hear a good preacher or, or you have somebody maybe in your prayer group that they can just speak the word of God to you in such a way that it just cuts through the mess and hits you where you live. He goes, man, if that's your gift, if your gift is prophecy, then that's what I need you doing in the service to God. So, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Again, when God st- talks about your sphere of influence, when he talks about your impact, he very often starts it with, don't boast, don't become prideful, don't think you're the guy. Remember, God is putting all of us in the right sphere of influence so that he can have the impact he's calling us to have. So again, we saw it in, in, in his letter to the church in Corinth. We see it here in his letter to the Romans. He says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. In accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Your sphere of influence is in accordance with the faith. If you're reading this out of the New American Standard or out of the English Standard Version that are word-for-word translations, it'll say, uh, in accordance with the measure of faith. There's that word metron again, the, the, with the measure of faith, with the portion of faith. God has given you a portion of faith that is, uh, that is aligned with the sphere of influence that he has called you to serve. And so some of you, you have a really big network. You're a social butterfly. People flock to you. People are drawn to you. People love you. And he's calling you to reach the people that are in your sphere of influence. Some of you, you're not that social. You don't have that many friends, but you've got a couple of people in your life They know you well enough. You're one of those deep friends, and you're one of the few people that they give permission to speak into your life. And so my proximity to people, because we live stream these sermons, we put them on the internet, my, my, my proximity to people might be larger than yours because I've got a spotlight on me every Sunday, but you know there's still people in your life that will not ever give me permission to speak into their life the way they've given you permission to influence and speak into your life. We all have a measure of faith that is in proportion to the sphere of influence, the, the measure of influence that God has called us to have in his kingdom. So what do we do with that? He says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many from one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. According to your measure of faith, God gives you a measure of grace. He gifts you with what you need to reach the people God is calling you to reach so that you can be a light shiner for Jesus Christ. He says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your measure of faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. I hope you're reading this list and I hope you're, you're sitting there going, man, some of those make me nervous. And then you find the one you're like, but I can do that. I've got a, a family member who uh, wants so badly to be a great preacher. And I don't think he ever will be. And I don't mean that, I, I, that's not insensitive because the truth is um, you put him at a church camp and he is the best counselor that I've ever seen. And he reaches these kids on a level that I can never reach. And it's like, I can step up and I can talk about it and I can teach on it. But when it comes to being the encourager, when it comes to just throwing an arm around somebody and loving them through the mess that they're burdened with, I look at that and I go, man, I'm never going to be able to do it the way that he can do it. And so I get very content. I, I, I got to preach a sermon this year at church camp. Um, it was tough. My, my topic was focusing on the grief of Jesus. And and so we talked about when Jesus raised Lazarus and he weeps with the family of Lazarus before he raises them. And we talked about all of that. And and in that sermon, I had to point out to, to these kids that are carrying burdens that some of us have never experienced before. I had to, to tell them that the purpose is Jesus. And no matter what you're going through, there is a purpose for your pain. And then afterwards, a few of the staff members said, man, that was the best camp sermon you've ever done which like the fleshly side of me goes, great, that means I haven't peaked yet, right? Like I'm still growing and that's awesome because you never really know 
when you're on like the downward slope of your ability to communicate with people. And so the fleshly side of me is like, oh good, best sermon I've ever done. Let's see if I can top it next year. Um, the spiritual side of me that, that knows better to, to, than to give in to that prideful temptation, I, I heard that and I'm just, I'm just thinking, God, like, God, thank you for giving me a place. Thank you for giving me a purpose at this camp and, and in my church because the truth is, I don't encourage the way some of my brothers and sisters encourage. I, I don't lead the way some of the leaders in the faith lead. I, I, I don't have some of these gifts, the, the gift of service that we just read about the, in the previous verse. I don't have that gift the way some of the people in this church have that gift. And so when I get to serve God and people are like, man, best one yet. Thank you so much for, for giving me that lesson. I really needed to hear that. I'm like, God, you have given me a measure of faith that corresponds with how you were calling me to influence people. And I can't do it all, but I don't have to because I don't have to boast beyond my measure of faith. I just have to serve where God calls me to serve. And so, man, maybe you wish you were a better teacher, but God called you to be an encourager. It's okay. Develop the teaching gift, man. Work on it. And, and we are going to do our best to give you opportunities to develop your spiritual giftedness. But if you're, if you're calling is nothing more than being an encourager, then you encourage and you encourage and you encourage and you keep lifting people up and you keep throwing an arm around people and you keep blessing the people around you. And what you will discover is there are so many people in the kingdom of God that are going to be moved more by that than any sermon they've ever heard preached from a pulpit. So whatever your gift is, if it's to encourage then give encouragement. If it's to give, then don't just give, but give generously. If it's to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then show mercy cheerfully. He goes on after that and talks about how this works in the church. But I was thinking about this passage because all week long at church camp, I'm watching people serve in their giftedness. And I was thinking how much church camp is a small example of what we do week after week in serving God in his church and in his kingdom. Um, one of the staff members we took to camp sent me uh, an encouraging text. We sent, uh, what, eight, nine kids, and then, and then five of us adults went as staff. And, and one of the staff sent me a text, and they said, hey, you know, um, I know you're not doing anything at camp that you don't always do the way that you, you know, study with people and you work with people and you encourage people and you, you let people just pour their burdens onto you and then you shoulder the burdens that, you know, in, in a very pastoral way. And they're, and they're kind of naming these, these things. I'm not saying any of this to brag on myself, but they're like, you know, and I'm, I know you do that all the time, but at church camp, you get to see the fruit a lot faster. And so it just reminds me the, the totality of your ministry. And they were basically just going like, hey, thank you for that. And I thought about that, how true that is, that at camp you get to see the fruit a lot faster. Let me give you a really bizarre uh, sermon illustration. Uh, it's, it's, it's a weird one, but, um, and, then, and then we'll show some pictures, we'll talk about this. But um, in the 80s, a guy named uh, Mike uh, Caro wrote basically a book about the mathematics of gambling, and he was covering different uh, games of chance, different elements of game theory and some of that. And he was talking about the game of poker, and he talked about, uh, he was trying to, to, to convince people that it's not really about the betting and any of that, that it's really about your position at the table because the game flows clockwise. And he was pointing out that really, if you're in a later position, that you have more information and so you stand a better chance to win because you can make better decisions. I know I'm boring you, bear with me, but people didn't believe him. So what he did to prove it is he put a camera face down on the table uh, over a game, over like a long 12-hour game. And he did this several times. And he'd, he'd, he'd record the whole game from this bird's eye view, and then he would time lapse it. And, and the cool thing about the time lapse is if you're sitting at the table, it feels so random. It feels very unpredictable. Sometimes that guy wins a hand. Sometimes that guy wins a hand. And so people are going, Carol, like, I don't think you can mathematically solve this game. And I, I don't think that I buy your theory. And he would show him the time lapse videos. He'd say, just watch. And when you see the time lapse videos, what you, when you see it sped up, the patterns emerge. And you can really see what's really going on when you can spot the patterns. And so he proved to that community that the game flows clockwise and that the chips on the table flow in this clockwise pattern across the game. And I thought about that because church camp is kind of like a time-lapse video. It's kind of, it's one week of 
what it usually takes a year or two to do in regular pastoral ministry. And so you get to see these snapshots, like you get to see this very condensed version of what it means to be a part of a faith community. And so the fruit just comes a lot faster and, and people uh, are able to just very quickly within a week of time. I mean, think about it. You, you get a bunch of teens out there and you go get off your phone for a week. There's no phones there's no screens. There's no distractions. You don't have to do homework tonight. You don't have any chores to do. Like when, when you're here this week, you're going to focus on each other. You're going to focus on the word of God. You're going to focus on your prayer life. And you're going to ask yourself some tough questions about faith and about God. And so in one week of time, we get to see transformation and we get to see lives change. And sometimes it takes longer than a week, but every year they come back and we see the maturity and we see the progress and we see people take steps in their faith. And I see these young people lead in ways that I didn't know they were capable of leading. And so in my cabin, I have the oldest boys cabin at church camp. I'll just give you a few examples. And um, one of the kids we brought, um, he's, he's intellectual. He's like me. He's a nerd. He'd rather, he'd rather just be learning things, doing nerdy stuff. And some of these other kids that were there were, were very social and they immediately like grouped up. They formed like, like we called them the wolf gang. Cause like they just hung out together. They just moved through the camp as this big, uh, as this big unit. And uh, man, they brought this guy in and they, they, they brought him into the group and I just saw him come alive socially. But by the end of the week, remember, he's the smart one. He's the intellectual one. He's good at handling his Bible. And so by the end of the week, when they're going, man, I've got these biblical questions, he's going, hey, let's have a study about it. And, and, and he was going to, to me and going, hey, Andrew, will you sit with us while we study the Bible? And I'm watching this guy who's been brought into this group, open up his Bible and teach them the word of God and not just teach them from the word, but go, man, let me tell you what I've been through. And let me tell you my testimony and let me bear out my struggles because I think it relates to what you've been going through. And I'm watching this young guy do it. And I just know outside of that environment, it would have taken me years to see that this young man is a leader in the faith. Somebody just needed to let him off the leash, right? And so you see these little moments of growth where you see everybody serving in their giftedness. It wasn't his role to be the group leader that week, but it, it was his role to be like the group chaplain, you know what I mean? To be the one that's answering their spiritual questions, that's going to the word with them. And I'm watching these kids serve in their giftedness in all these awesome ways. Um, I've, we got a picture. Show, uh, there's a storm blew through one night. We're going to talk about people serving in their giftedness. See if you can find the picture, Brianna, of, uh, of the storm. Um, the storm blew through, and like we're watching the lightning happen, and we're like, man, it is coming. And when it hit, it just swept through hard and fast. It was just this torrential downpour of rain. And as it's coming, one of the, the kids looks at me, and he's like, hey, man, can we go play in the rain? And it's like we had finished our evening worship. It's pretty much like the sun setting. It's dark. And uh, he, he asked me, hey, can we go play in the rain? You're like 16, 17-year-old boys that like... Just they just want to go play around and goof off in the rain and uh, and uh, and my first instinct because I don't want to do that is to be like nah we should probably come inside and so I tell him I'm like listen like he's like well can we just stand in under the pavilion and watch and I'm like dude there's no standing under that pavilion like this rain is coming in sideways like you're gonna get soaked no matter where you're at and and I could tell like he's just eager and I look over just off in the distance and I see Tanner watching the storm with just a twinkle in his eye. And I just knew, I was like, all right, if you can find an adult that's going to go out there with you. And I didn't even, I, I, I've never even told, because Tanner's already just like grabbing kids. And he's like, hey, let's go play in the rain, right? And so sure enough, here's Tanner and, and a group of the guys just out there doing some weird chant, just absolutely soaked to the bone, just having the time of their lives just with these older boys in the middle of the rain. And I was watching them and they come back to the cabin. They're all just sopping wet, right? Just to the bone. And, I, and I'm looking at them, I'm going, that is not my service. Like I, I would not have done that. I was not going to do that. But that's why Tanner's there. And there's so many, there's so many of these. If, if you can show some pictures. Uh, there's a few pictures of, of us teaching some Bible classes. Uh, man, Tanner was right there with me in my discussion class and we're teaching. Um, and uh, there's the girls class. Miss, uh, who is that? Miss Jamie teaching. Yeah, we'll get to it. Um, 
And, and the whole time, like he's there, he's helping me teach and he's helping me lead these lessons and, and he's doing all of that. But the whole time there, there's part, there's certain things that he could do that I couldn't do. Like they would come to me with these heavy stuff, man. Like, Hey, you preached on grief and this is what I've been struggling with. And, and I'm game for that. I will sit there and I will sit with you in your grief and in your struggle. And I will pray with you and I will encourage you and I'll study the Bible with you. But also notice there's some kids that they weren't ready for any of that. What they needed was a friend. They needed somebody that would just give them the kind of attention they don't always get. And so we would look over, there's one of our classes, there's Tanner teaching us, a few of the oldest boys, the graduated seniors and and seniors. Um, and, uh, and I just look at this, look at this guy with a youth ministry degree and then a preacher. And then the guy over there is the captain of a police force in Houston and just different, completely different gifts, completely different walks of life. That's our head boys counselor in the back. He's uh, he's not a teacher. He's not a preacher. But the guy runs a type ship, and he keeps us all organized, and, and he makes sure that we have everything that we need and that we're provided for and that we're accounted for. And so we, we depend on that guy for his leadership, and, and sometimes they depend on me for the teaching, and then they depend on Tanner just to bridge that gap between head knowledge and actually putting it into practice. And so I noticed during some of the quiet time, during some of the free time, the electives, I'd be like, man, where are our kids at? And I'd look under this big oak tree that we're all sitting under in this picture. I'd look under, and it would be Tanner with all the kids. And he's just there hanging out with them and loving on them. I'm like, man, Tanner's a good preacher. Uh, he's a good teacher. I, I, hope, I hope that I'm better. Now, hear me out. That's not, like, really, I do. I, I, like, I get to do it every week, right? Like, I hope, I hope that I'm better. Otherwise, like, what is my sphere of influence, right? Um, but what he is so much better. Like he's a good teacher and preacher, but in addition to that, what he's so much better at that is when those kids just need a friend, like, hey, Tanner, will you come sit with us? We want to be under, we want to be in the shade. Will you join us? And I, and I realized like they don't come to me for that. Not anymore. They haven't done that in like 10 years or so, right? Like, I guess I just got old to them all of a sudden. Uh, but to Tanner, they come to him. This is not a class. Like, there's no Bible class. There's, this is just free time. And look at all of them. This is like Tanner's holding court, right? Uh, and that's like, that's his service, right? He's the guy that's playing in the rain. He's the guy that's, that's pushing the kid's head underwater in the swimming pool during swim time. Where do you think Andrew is during swim time? I'm in the shade, putting on more sunscreen, trying not to be out there, <laughs> certainly not swimming with all of these kids. And he's out there, you know, just pushing them into the pool and sitting with them under the tree. And you look at that and you see everybody's giftedness serving the kingdom. And when it all comes together, it comes together in such a beautiful way. Miss Paula came with us and, and she, was, she was there for one specific ministry. She had a specific purpose of being there because she was bringing somebody to camp who, who has a, a, a few extra uh, things to consider for him to get through his day in a, in a positive way. And she was there to make sure he was going to fit at camp and do well and serve at camp. And then when she wasn't with him, she was serving, she was helping out with crafts, and she was helping people set up with the theme nights, and she was just finding a way to get involved and to serve the camp. And I look at that, I'm going, man, I can't do that. I, I don't have the ministry that she has. It was focused, and it was intentional. And, and her grandson, who she brought, had a great time at camp. And I got to teach him some, and, and it was such a blast to see him be comfortable and, and, and fit in and just, uh, just be everybody's just favorite camper that year. Um, I got to see Janae baptize a girl, uh, which, you know, is not that camp's tradition. Uh, but a, about a year ago, a little girl, little girl, tiny, sweet, little, precious, innocent thing who doesn't come from a church home. Uh, she, she was brought there to camp by a mutual friend, and she doesn't have a lot of church background, and she was just sitting there. She's soaking it up. And she was soaking up the singing and she's just listening to all the lessons. And you can tell like she is just enamored by these Bible teachings and these stories. And she wants to know more. And we were talking about our spiritual disciplines. We we're talking about our prayer, prayer life. And, and so a year ago at camp, uh, it was one of the last days of camp. And, and our director, one of my best friends, he's a youth minister, camp director, Riley. He said, um, hey, uh, who would like to close the prayer? And none of the boys raised their hands. And this sweet little girl who's never said an out loud prayer in her life, but she's been hearing them all week long. She raises her hand 
And Riley knows, he's like, man, in our tradition, people get uncomfortable with the girls praying. And, and so and he doesn't know what to do, and, and he doesn't want to break her heart. And so he just doesn't notice her. And he just kind of looks around. He's like, anyone? Any, anyone with their hand? Oh, you over there in the back. And it just broke the girl's heart. And when he found out that she was heartbroken, it broke his heart because she wrote, she wrote him a letter and she goes, I really don't understand why I can't pray to God the way some of you guys pray to God. And, and, and I want to be able to pray to God like that. And then she writes in her letter, and this just, I mean, this made Riley cry. It made all of us cry. She writes in her letter, she says, here's what I wanted to say to him. And she writes out her prayer word for word and then hands the letter to Riley. And so it started a discussion. And people are going, hey, man, like, like these, these young girls hungry in their faith are going, man, I look in the Bible and I see, I see, I see, Samuel's mom, Hannah, praying to God about her son. Like, like we see these women praying these prayers in the Bible, and, and I want to do that, and why can't I? And all of us are scrambling, trying to come up with a good answer, something beyond male ego, and we're going, well, you know, you don't want to usurp their authority, and this little innocent girl, not understanding the, 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 the traditions and the cultures, this little innocent girl goes, well, which man here doesn't want me to be able to pray? And that was her position. She was like, usurp their authority. Like, and and I, like, I, got the, I get the argument, right? Because in her mind, she's going, well, to usurp their authority, that means they don't want me to pray. And it would be usurping their authority. If I did want to pray, why on earth do you guys not want me to pray? And, and so we began studying with her and encouraging her. And she began encouraging us. And by the way, we had these young ladies in the faith sing some songs and, and lead some prayers. And it was beautiful and it was awesome. It was encouraging. And it didn't usurp anybody's authority. In fact, it, it challenged the men to step up and to lead that and to steward that and to pray over that and to, to, uh, to honor that. And so they began studying together. And she was young in the faith. And so Janae kept studying. She, she had a Bible study with her. And last year it ended with her going, uh, going, hey, look, I want you to write down all your questions and, uh, and I want you to keep praying about this. I want you to keep studying your Bible and we're going to keep this conversation going. She's like, I'm ready for baptism. She's like, you're, you're very young and I want to make sure, you know, but one thing, so our camp session had five baptisms this year. It's not a huge camp. So five baptisms is incredible. And then when you factor in the fact that we don't rush kids to the water at our camp, because we know like if we deprive you of enough sleep at a week-long camp session, if we keep you up all night studying the Bible, we wake you up early in the morning, you're out there in the heat all week long. By the end of the week, man, it, it, it's, it, the, the guard is down, and we don't ever want to manipulate that or take advantage of that. And so we're one of the camps where like, we are hesitant to baptize kids without talking to their parents, without talking to their preacher, without uh, understanding where they're coming from and really knowing, like, are they ready to commit their lives to Christ in a real and authentic way. And so this little girl, she comes back this year and she's ready to study. She's hungry for it. And so she sits down with Janae and they begin this Bible study and, uh, and all the other girls are around. A whole group of people end up joining this Bible study. At one point, I got to walk up to the Bible study and I'm sitting here listening to, to Janae lay out the word of God. And, and the thing about it is like she she was making a few points. And I'm like, hey, that's a me thing. Like, that's the way I always connect the dots in that scripture. Like, I think she borrowed that from me. And she's also making biblical points where I'm sitting there taking notes. I'm like, oh, that's a great way to say that. But I walked up behind her. She didn't know I was there. That is, oh, that's it, isn't it? Um, or at least something similar to it. That's one of the studies she was having. I ended up walking up and sitting in the chair uh, kind of behind because I didn't want her to know. I, I wanted, I've never gotten to hear how my wife does a Bible study when I'm not there. And like she was like trying to explain how the Holy Spirit uh, works in us and serves to, to help us uh, grow towards God and sanctify us. And she, she was like doing Jiminy Cricket impersonations and talking in funny voices. And, and like, she, like she's doing all the things to study the Bible with these young people in a way that they could understand. And, and they got it and they were connecting the pieces. And so this little girl comes up and she says, I am ready. I want to be baptized. And, and, and we talked to the parents and everything. And she goes, and I'd like you to do it. And I get to watch Janae be a spiritual mom to these young ladies at this camp in a way that I will never get to be what she is to them. I will never have the ministry that she has. 
at the end of the week, the girls, do, while the guys are all being rowdy and, and trying our hardest to rein in the inappropriate boy humor and all of that stuff, the girls are in there do, like having this share circle where they all say nice things about each other and it's very fluffy and it's the kind of stuff that the boys are like boring, right? And so uh, the girls are doing all of that and the girls are telling Janae, that she's like a mom in their faith. And, and they're talking about how much she's uh, been an encouragement to them and, 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 and one of those loving people to them. And then, and then we have Cassie with us. Cassie's our, our, our media ministry. And she's like a big sister to them, which is kind of a tough role because when you're in the big sister role, you're helping the spiritual parents, right? Like you're also teaching and you're also leading and you're, you're, kinda, you're, you're supporting the other uh, teachers and preachers and ministers, but at the same time, you're being tender to the, to the young people and you're loving on them and you're throwing an arm around them and encouraging them. And so it's both the ministry role and the support role at the same time. And, and to hear these young girls go, man, you're, you're, you're like a big sister to me. And to one of our campers, she's literally the big sister, or to two of our campers actually, um, that we brought, because uh, she brought both of her siblings. And, and uh, to, to hear everybody serve in these ways where I'm sitting there going, I can't do that. I can't serve the way they can. But the truth is, you and I both have gifts. We, we have a measure of faith in proportion to the measure of service, to the sphere of influence that God has given us in the kingdom. And if I serve the best way I know how, and you serve the best way you know how, the impact is tremendous and lives are changed and churches grow and cities transform and the culture around us begins to honor Christ in our decision-making more than we've ever seen before when all of us lead and work and serve together as many parts of one body. Do we have a picture of the cooks? Yeah, let's, let's keep that picture up for a while because I want you to see this. Um, Anybody here ever been like a cook at a church camp? Do we have? Okay, I see, I see some hands. Um, the cooks have the worst job at the camp. Because here's the thing. When I'm out there and I'm preaching, I'm teaching these kids, and, and, I'm, and I'm letting the light bulbs go on, or when I'm sitting there with a kid crying on my shoulder because it's the first place all year that this guy who has to be tough all year long for his family and tough for his friends, this is the first place where he feels safe enough to talk about what's really going on in his personal life. And he's just crying on my shoulder. I'm able to give that encouragement. And they come up to you afterwards. And they're like, man, you have no idea how much you mean to me. You changed my life. Like I get to see all of that. I get to see the twinkle in their eyes when they're hearing the gospel of Jesus, not just preached to them, but shown to them through love. And you get to see it and you get to see the smiles on their faces. And the whole time that's happening, the cooks are in the kitchen doing what cooks do. And so like they serve all week long just to see like one minute of the kids coming through the line, um, like three times a day. Right. And so like they spend almost no time with the very people that they're spending their entire week serving. And so because of that, some years at church camp, and I'm saying this because listen, this is a parallel to the church. Some of you are in this Position. You might not be a cook, but some of you, you serve the church in a way where you never get any credit. Most people don't even know your name, and most people have no idea how you serve and what you do and what your contribution is. But if we didn't have you serving in the background doing what you do, it wouldn't happen, and lives wouldn't be changed, and there would be people uh, that, that wouldn't have the experience that they have. And so some years the church has come in, and tell me you don't see this in the church in a different way. Let's say churches. Some years the cooks come in and they recognize, oh yeah, I'm slaving away in the kitchen all day and they're out there having fun with the kids and they get jaded and they get bitter and they get upset by it. Uh, but for whatever reason, the last several years at camp, our, our cooks have always had the best attitudes and they're so loving and they're so kind and, and, uh, and they're so patient with those of us that break the rules. I, I walk in and, and hug a cook and steal whatever they're, they're making and, uh, and they are patient with it and they're very loving. And, and I'm like, man, we've just got these, these, the best cooks we've ever had. And as I was looking at this picture, I started thinking about like what makes this group of cooks that have been cooking together at this camp for like five or six years now together, what makes them so good? Like, why are they so willing to do all the hard parts of camp without any of the good parts of camp? And I started noticing the lady taking the picture here, that's, uh, that's my sister-in-law, Loretta. I, I married her husband's little sister. 
and she has four kids uh, that are, she has three kids that are campers and one kid that is staffed this year. And that's wild because the kid that was staffed this year, like she sat on my lap during worship my very first year at church camp. I was 15 years old and she was like one something like that. And, uh, and I, I'll never forget it because like, I'm not Uncle Andrew yet, right? I'm just Janae's boyfriend and I'm holding this little baby and her diaper busts and I look down and my entire pants are just soaked with this little baby's pee. That's a weird thing to say in a sermon. Um, and, but it's good because now she's my niece and I get to bring it up every single year at church camp. I'm like, hey, you remember your first year at church camp when, you, when you're, anyway. And so, uh, but she's, she's like 20 now and she's, or 19 or whatever, however old she is, I don't know. And she's staff at our camp. She's a, she's a counselor in training at our camp. And so, so she's, had, she's had three kids that are campers, one kid that is staff now. Um, the lady who's waving in the back, uh, her daughter is there in the blue shirt, who's now also staff and helping and cooking. Uh, her, her boys, her, her two twin boys were in my class. They've been They've been in my class for a few years now, which means we're about to graduate them out of class because I teach the oldest boys. Uh, the lady um, who, are, who is our head cook, the lady in the green shirt with the robe, she, uh, she brings her nephew. I won't say too much about this. But suffice to say that um, he doesn't have the easiest time at home, and she does everything she can to, to grab him and, and bring, her, bring him along with her when she can. She brings him to camp every year. And uh, the lady on the far left, her son is married to one of my best friends. I remember when I was like 18 years old and he was like 14 or 15 years old at camp. I, I studied with him one night and we, we, he said, hey man, I, I, I want to commit my life to Christ. I want to get baptized. And it was like a winter retreat or something. So we didn't have the pool. I was like, we don't have a baptistry. So we put a tarp in the back of a truck and stuck a water hose in it and waited till there was enough water in this truck bed that we could like both get on our knees and I could baptize him in the back of the truck. And so I look at this and I go, you know what? None of them get to see the moment when the light bulb comes on. None of them have seen it at camp, but every one of them have felt the impact. All of them know the difference that their service makes because they have kids that have had their life change from that camp. Uh, there's another lady who's not in the picture. She's probably like off to the side doing dishes or something. And uh, all four of her kids are coming through camp. Her two oldest boys um, still call me when, when they have a, a, a Bible question. We still talk about our faith together and, and they talk about, man, you, you guys have been such an impact in our lives and, and mom gets to see it, right? And so I, I notice, I'm like, man, the people that are willing to do the job in the kingdom of God that nobody else wants to do, the reason they're so willing to do it is because they've seen the difference. They know the impact that their service has in the Lord's church because their kids' lives have been changed through that fruitful ministry. I think about some of you, you never want to be on stage. You, you tell me no every time I say, hey, will you do communion, a, a communion thought or whatever? But I know if I call and say, hey man, can you bring a trailer? We're moving all this stuff. Bring a pair of gloves. It's going to be hard, sweaty work, but we got to do this for, for, our, for our church. And they're like, when do you need me there, right? And, and there's, the, there's the men and women in this church that you guys serve so faithfully in the background. And there's the people that you're encouraging and the people that you're praying for and the, and the, the ministries that you're supporting, that you're giving to. And, and I know like you, you're never there. You're never in the Bible study. You, you've never sitting in the marriage counseling. You, you're never uh, there when, when you're usually not the ones when they say, hey, will you baptize me because you've been such an influence? But you've seen the difference and you felt the change, and you've seen the culture shift, and some of you are going, man, whatever I can do. Like, I might not be able to do that, or I might not be able to do what Tanner does. I might do what Cassie does, but if I just keep serving in the background, if I keep doing my part, then I'll get to see the difference. I can feel the impact that God is making in my ministry. So I say all this because, one, it was an awesome week, and I just wanted you guys to know that God is working, and lives are changing, and things are happening, and the eight kids that we took, man, what a blessing they were to have at this camp. Uh, I, I'm, I'm proud of our youth. I'm so proud of our youth because most of them have never been to a camp like that. I, I don't think any of them have been to a camp like that before the group that we took this year, and over half of them 
really tried hard to put their foot down and said, I'm not going. I don't want to do that. I don't want to give up my phone for a week. I don't want to go sweat. I don't want to shower in a, in, a, in a bathhouse where there's like four showers and there's other people in there. And I don't want to sleep in a cabin where there's 20 people in the room when I'm trying to sleep. And they're like, no way. That sounds awful. And the truth is it is awful. There's so many things about camp that are just awful. Like you're hot and you're sweaty and you're tired and you're never alone. And people never quiet down ever, like for a whole week straight. And for any of you that are a little bit introverted, you're like, that sounds like a nightmare. And to some of our campers, like they went there and they're like, man, I really don't think I'm going to like it. And they went through the first half of camp and they're like, this is kind of rough. And then they saw it. The moment where the singing comes together. It was Wednesday night. I think we were all gathered in the mess hall and somebody started a song and we turned the lights on. Everybody just started singing. And some of our kids have never heard the roots that we come from. They've never heard the non-instrumental singing done like that, done the way it is that it only comes together like that a few times a year. And they heard it and you could see the light bulb go off and they go, man, this is good. And this is pure. And this is amazing. I'm glad that I can be a part of it. And one of our kids who didn't want to go and he told his mom, I'm not going. And she's like, well, I'm going to make you go. And he's like, well, then I'm going to go, but I'm doing it in protest. I don't want to be there. Like by night four, he's like, hey, Andrew, this is what I want to bring to, for, for my talent night next year. And I'm like, oh, so you're coming back next year. He's like, oh yeah, I'm going to be here. I'm going to bring my friends and, and, and me and this other camper that I just met that I'm now buddies with, we're going to do this, this skit together on skit night. And he's like talking about all this stuff. I'm sitting there going, this is the guy who didn't want to go. He's also the guy that's praying with people and studying the Bible with people, and making friends, and talking about how much of a difference it's made. And so, so just, if for no other reason, then I want you guys to hear me say it. I'm so proud of the young people in this church, because they did a hard thing. They did something that they didn't, that they weren't really comfortable with. Um, it, it, was, it was rough on them, and they saw the impact, and they were part of the difference. They were the ones loving on other people and making space for other people and putting an arm around other people and leading prayers when they'd never done that before. And I, I'm just, I'm watching the difference get made. And so I want to say to the parents in the room, to the grandparents in the room, to all of you that you're not parents and grandparents, but you're spiritual parents, you're spiritual examples, to all of you that are doing the gritty work of service, to all the people that are going to be packing up the TV and, and doing the things that we do, and the people that are leading our worship, I know you're not always there in the moment that the difference is made. You keep serving the way God's calling you to serve, you'll see the impact. And here's what I believe. I believe, like the Bible says, there are many members but one body. And if you serve in the measure of faith that God has called you to serve, or giving generously, or teaching, or serving, or encouraging, or speaking words of prophecy, if you, call, if you serve in the way that you are called to serve, in the proportion of faith that God has given you, and the person next to you does it, and I keep doing it, and we all do it together, we might not see each other's moments, we might not see the light bulbs come on, but we will feel the difference the culture around us will change. The city will begin to change. There will be souls reached for the gospel of Jesus Christ. People will see, not always through the preached word, but through your actions, they will see through your actions that Jesus Christ, as you serve as an image bearer to Jesus, they will see that Jesus Christ loves them in the way that only he can love them because they've been shown love in the way that only you can love them. And so here's my message for you this morning, guys. Continue to stay faithful faithful to the work of service that God has called you to, because when all of us do it together, lives change, churches change, people change, the city changes, the world changes for good, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of people who serve God in their giftedness like you, and God willing, as he allows, as he assigns a portion of faith like me as well. I want to pray with you guys, and then that's going to be our service this morning, uh, at least the preaching portion. Let's pray. God, we come to you thankful for you, humbled by you. As we get ready to commune with you through the breaking of bread around the table, as we're mindful of what it means to commune together as the body of Christ, God, I'm just so aware that it takes many members, but one body for the body to function well. I'm so proud for those moments 
where everything just gets sped up like a time-lapse video. I'm so thankful for those moments where you just get to see the fruit so quickly and you get to see everybody's impact so quickly. But I'm so aware that it's just a picture of the church. As I gather here praying with my church, God, I'm just so aware that you've got us serving in so many different areas and, and we depend on you to bring it together and for you to change the lives and for you to have the impact that our ministry has. And so God, we just give this prayer to you. We ask you to challenge us, to call us, to increase our sphere of influence so that we can keep serving as you've called us to serve and blessing the people around us. Help us to stay focused on you. Help us to not get burnt out when we're not seeing the moment that the light bulb turns on. God, we just pray that you show us the fruit, that you show us the impact, that you call each of us to a place in your ministry for your kingdom so that your gospel can reach the people in our community that's far from God. We just pray this in Jesus' name as we stand and worship you. Amen.